right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmid, and today we're chatting with Dr. William Lane Craig and Dr. Ryan Mullins on God, time, creation, and everything in between. Uh, while I myself have much to say on these topics, uh, my goal today is going to be to play a moderating role. And I'm going to be short with the introduction because most of my audience will know both of you guys, both of my guests. But Dr. William Lane Craig is a philosopher and theologian who has published widely in philosophy of religion, philosophy of time, metaphysics, and more. Likewise, Dr. Ryan Mullins is a theologian and philosopher who publishes primarily in analytic theology and philosophy of time. So thank you guys both for coming on. I'm very excited for this. The first segment of this video is defining our terms. So let's begin with time, firstly. Uh, Dr. Craig affirms a relational theory of time, whereas Dr. Mullins affirms the absolute theory of time. And we're gonna need some clarity on these terms before looking at arguments for and against each view. So Dr. Craig, can you tell us a little bit about the relational theory of time? Certainly. I think that the contrast to be drawn here, Joe, is between a relational theory of time and a substantival view of time. The word absolute uh, in these debates is used so many different ways that the term is ambiguous or, or multivalent. And so I don't think it's helpful to draw this distinction as relational versus absolute. Rather, the distinction is between a view that thinks of time as a substance, uh, something that actually exists, as opposed to a relational view that sees time as a relation of before and after between events. And I myself actually am very open to either view, but I tend not to believe that time is a substance, a thing, uh, and that therefore it's plausibly a relation of before and after that arises from the occurrence of events. I just want to make sure I'm getting it just right. So it's not a thing in your ontology. Time is not a thing in your ontology. It's just a relationship between events of before and after. Yeah. Okay. Craig's right. Like when you look at all the literature, absolutes are used in a million different ways. Yeah. So substantivalism usually is a better way to go because that is actually the claim. When you look at Eastern and Western philosophers throughout history, they're going to say that time is an actual substance. And so typically what they'll say in Eastern and Western philosophy is that time is an eternal and uncaused substance, and it plays several different roles. And then there's precedence within Christianity and Hinduism, maybe Islam. Uh, I've been trying to talk to some different scholars on this. Uh, there's precedent to say that time should be identified with God. So you see this in Henry Moore, you see this in Isaac Newton and Samuel Clark, and then you see this in Raghunata Sharomani in the, in the Hindu tradition. And then what the absolute theory does is they'll make a distinction between time and moments of time. So a moment of time is the way things are, but could be subsequently otherwise. And so here's the big idea. So time plays three big roles. First, it's the it, time is the thing that makes change possible. And then second, uh, time is the source of moments. And then third, time is the thing that unifies a series of moments into a coherent timeline. And so on this sort of kind of like Newtonian or Morian view that I'm, that I'm wanting to defend, I want to say that God should be identified with time. And this is because God is an eternal uncaused substance that makes change possible. So given God's power and freedom, change is possible. And then further, God is the source of moments because God all alone prior to creation, that's a particular way that things are. And given his eternal power and freedom, that's a way things are, but could be subsequently otherwise. So because God could subsequently otherwise be otherwise if he chooses to exercise his power and his freedom to like do something different, to create something. And then further, I want to say that God's the thing that unifies a series of moments into a coherent timeline. So whatever theory of providence you want to affirm, you want to be a theological determinist, you want to be a Molinist, you want to be an open theist, it doesn't matter. Whatever theory of providence you tell, that's the story of how God goes about organizing or arranging the different moments into a successive uh, series or a timeline. That's, that's the big idea. Yeah, so Dr. Craig, if you want to ask him like clarifying questions before we go on to like reasons to believe these, you can if now if you want to do that. It sounds to me like pantheism. Uh, to identify time with God sounds pantheistic, so I wouldn't be surprised to see this in Hinduism. But Ryan, I think it's certainly not Isaac Newton's view. Uh, Newton was explicit uh, that time is an 
emanative effect of God's being. Um, and so I'd like to know, uh, why not affirm with Newton that God is the emanative cause of time and space, rather than that he is identical with time? That would allow you to affirm the sort of things that you just did affirm, but it wouldn't identify God and time, which seems to me to be a move we ought not to make. Mm -hmm. So we got two different claims here, one interpretations about uh, Newton, and then two, uh, the charge of pantheism. So pantheism says that God and the world are identical to each other. Uh, on the move that the Sharomini and these others are making, when they're saying that there's time and then there's moments of time, there's a distinction there. And then there's things that occur at moments or exist at moments. So there's a bunch of more distinctions there. So you and I, we exist at particular moments. We're not identical to moments and moments aren't identical to time. So we've got all sorts of distinctions. And so nothing here is being identical to God. So just saying time is like a mode or an attribute uh, is, is kind of the way it's typically spelled out. Oh, oh, but you did say that time is identical to God. I thought that was what yeah. you just that was yeah, so your... time is, but moments of time are not identical to time, because uh, historically, this view distinguishes these two things. Mm -hmm. Aren't moments of time components of time? Those are the parts or intervals into which time can be divided? I, I want to deny this, because I want to say uh, moments of time are contingent features uh, of, of, of reality. Uh, most of them are, other than like maybe like the first moment or something. Um, because again, there's time and then there's this other stuff called these moments and time is the source of these moments. Mm -hmm. And I don't but, understand why I should think they're in a part whole relationship. Um, mainly because I don't, when I, when I look at part whole relationships outside of material objects, I lose my grasp of what we're talking about very fast in any literal sense. And since we're talking about an immaterial God and moments, which a lot of times people take moments to be abstract to. Should I take those to be literal parts? I don't know. It sounds weird. Well, I think we can think of moments as intervals of time, um, and they could be various durations of time. Um, and so it would seem to me that moments would be intervals into which time can be divided, which would be one more reason I wouldn't want to identify God with time. But you are thinking of moments as something that's different from intervals of time, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I guess the way I would see intervals, intervals would be a set of moments, because I think temporal relationships are between moments, uh, mm -hmm. is, is typically how I'm going to see it. So this is like the way like Ulrich Mayer and, um, and uh, Kit Fine start to kind of define things. Um, so it's a very different way of looking at it than than some some uh, some of the like kind of the, like the twentieth century analytic philosophy has looked at things, um, but yeah, should we get onto the the Newton claim though? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Emily Thomas's book uh, Absolute Time riffs in modern British philosophy. So she tries to give a different interpretation of Newton. So she looks through all these letters of Newton, uh, a lot of correspondence that he had with different people, and she says when you're looking at the, these claims about emanative uh, effects. Uh, emanation and emanative causes. She's like, there's a particular way that a lot of the moderns are using that term. And so her claim, this is her claim, and I'm just following hers, is that the way that should be interpreted is, is attributes are imitate emanative effects of substances. And she gives a lot of textual evidence for this in a bunch of different thinkers. Um, so she acknowledges up front, this is a, there's a debate about how to interpret these things. But I think she has a very interesting long interpretative uh, uh, argument for why that's the case. So she gives a lot of textual evidence. But but yeah, it, there is a debate here to be had about the right way to interpret Newton. Okay, okay um, so I think that's that's good by way of clarifying questions on these two views, the relational versus the substantival view for the audience. Again, the relational view essentially says that time is a relation between events, whereas a substantival view says that time is a substance in some manner. And Ryan, gave further characterizations and roles that it plays, like making change possible, being the source of moments, etc. Okay, so now that we've got the distinction on the table, we can now go to some reasons to think that each respective view is correct. So we're going to begin with Dr. Craig, and I guess we can ask, maybe what are some of the motivations? Or like, what's your main motivation, Dr. Craig, for thinking that the relational view of time is true? 
Well, I don't have any knockdown argument for uh, which way to think of time. Um, in my work on God and time, this was one of the questions that I didn't have time to explore uh, adequately because I was so preoccupied with what I think is the far more important question of whether time is tensed or tenseless. It seems to me that that's the real watershed issue and that ultimately it makes no difference uh, to God's relationship to time, whether we think of time as a substance or as a, a relation. I just have real trouble thinking of times being a substance, um, especially if time is tensed. Substances endure through time, but time doesn't endure through time. So it seems to me that it's just a category mistake to think of time as a substance. Now, Ryan would make time a substance by identifying time with God. And as I've already expressed my misgivings about this, I, I think this is quite wrong. Um, time is one dimensional and has the geometrical properties of a line. God does not. Time can be divided into moments which elapse one after another. God cannot. The parts of time are related as earlier than and later than. God is not. Moreover, God is personal. Time is not. God has compassion on us. Time does not. God forgives our sins. Time does not. God is the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is not. So it seems to me just wrong to think of God and time as identical. Um, so I don't have a knockdown argument uh, to offer for a substantival view of time. It just seems to me time isn't a substance. And it seems to me further than in the other utter absence of anything happening, that that would be a state of timelessness. Uh, nothing's going on. There wouldn't be any before and after in the utter absence of any events. Uh, and so those are uh, the reasons for my uh, uh, inclination toward uh, a non-substantival view of time. Yeah, Ryan. So before getting on to some of your reasons for you mm -hmm. know believing in a substantival view, I think it'd be interesting to have you guys like interact a little bit on some of the reasons that uh, Dr. Craig just gave. Yeah. So when when different people are saying that we are identifying time with God, that the claim is it's it's like a mode or an attribute of God. Uh, and if that's the case, then a lot of the objections you just la laid out wouldn't really make a big deal. So omnipotence doesn't forgive you. Omnipotence doesn't have compassion on you. God does. Well, okay. That's a, well. Who cares? No problem. Uh, same thing about time. You're like, well, not time doesn't have compassion on you. Time doesn't create you. And you're like, well, right. God does. Time is an attribute of God. So not really seeing the force of this once we get clear on what the claim is. Um, the other thing is a lot of the statements made here um, about, about time being tensed, I think these are statements about the timeline, about the moments of time. Uh, so time I don't think is tensed, but moments are tensed or reality as a whole would be tensed. Um, and so, yeah, so I think what's going on here in a lot of these sort of cases, a lot of these debates is when people are looking at certain questions, they're thinking about the moments themselves or the timeline itself and not time itself. So this is a point that uh, Marcello Fiocco raises a lot in his work where he says, look, unless philosophers of time tell you what time is, all they're doing is having these debates about tense versus tenseless, uh, A theory, B theory, endurance, perdurance, you name it. Unless you know what time itself is, how do we know we're even having a debate about uh, reality itself or about time itself? And so for him, he's saying, when we get clear on what time is, and he lays out the view that I just laid out, other than the God stuff, he doesn't seem to care about God. Uh, he'll say, all those debates are about the timeline. They're not about time itself. That's, that's, that's the strategy, at least. It seems to me, therefore, Ryan, that you, you are not, in fact, saying that time is identical with God or to be identified with God. You're saying time is a mode or property of God, in which case it's not a substance because properties and modes aren't substances. So this is a, a non-substantival view of time of some sort. And I would wonder 
what would be the difference between saying time is a property or mode of God and simply saying that God is temporal? Because I agree with the latter statement. I think that God is in time. He experiences time and the succession of moments, but I wouldn't identify it with his property. So what would be the difference between mm -hmm. identifying time with a property of God and simply affirming that God is temporal, which we both want to do? Yeah, so there's different motivations here. So Samuel Clark, when he's looking at this sort of stuff, he'll he'll say, we don't want to say God's in time. Uh, we can say that if we speak in the vulgar. That's that's what his, his statement is. So that's just me quoting him. So I'm not saying anything that's vulgar about saying God's in time. Uh, he says better to say God's temporal. But he also thinks that time itself is eternal uh, because he thinks it's like there has to be something eternal. Uh, and that's the first premise in his cosmological argument. And then from there, he goes, time itself is eternal. And then from there, he starts giving you all these other divine attributes. And you're like, whoa, this is interesting. So so one motive, historical motivation, at least for someone like Clark, is to go, this seems to be the way the world is. For someone like Raghunata Sharomani, it's a different context. The motivation there is to go, we've got this particular ontology where we've got space, time, the ether, sound, because apparently sound's a substance in, in our uh, ontology. Don't know why. Uh, and he says, this is a ridiculously bloated ontology. I don't need all these different substances floating around. I just need one. And it's God. I just need one substance that can do it all. And so it's sort of a, a way of kind of like taking like an Occam's razor approach and saying, I can have one substance that just does all this work. Yeah, that, that is pantheism, though. I think we want to resist that. I like the Newtonian Clarkian view um, that God is uh, temporal, has the property of being temporal. But I, I don't think we need to go beyond that to say that it, uh, the time is a mode of God himself. And, and so let's leave this Hindu pantheist to the side and ask, why should we disagree with Newton or Clark, uh, as I interpret them, and just think of God as an eternal being who endures omnitemporally? Mm -hmm. uh, well, first, I, still, I disagree. It's not pantheism because dude say some things exist in time and they're not identical to time so you and i exist in time and we're not identical to time no but this fellow you quoted the the pan yeah and that's that's what the uh, sharomity would say too you only need one substance right and that does it all there's really only one thing that exists for a certain set of categories uh for contingent beings like the successive universes uh, all the different souls all the different prime matter and all that sort of stuff that's not god uh, on this view um, so there, so it wouldn't be pantheism. Um, but yeah, so, so back to the, so looking at like a Clark Morian sort of, sort of stuff, here would be the idea. If we want to give like a full story of the world and have a lot of metaphysical explanatory power, uh, to try to account for fundamental features of reality, things like time and space. And if you don't think time and space are the sort of things that could begin to exist or that could be created, you've got a nice, neat package that you can give of saying, if these are divine attributes. So You've got an eternal being, you get, and you got to get, get your eternal time. I don't know how I feel about eternal space. I don't understand what space is, to be honest. But that's, that's some of the views here. Is they're saying, like, I've got a lot of explanatory power in what I can do, all wrapped up in a nice theistic package. Well, Ryan, now let's go on to talking about your reasons for thinking that the relational view of time is false. We got some sort of motivations from Dr. Craig and now mm -hmm. maybe some um, anti-motivations from you. Uh, so so let, let's hear those. All right, so I've got I've got two problems I want to highlight for the relational theory. So the first is it's difficult to figure out what the relational theory really is, and then the second is the relational theory runs into different circularity problems. So let's start with the first one. So W.H. Uh, Newton Smith he comments that the relational theory of time it's been so attractive to physicists and philosophers that they've not really bothered to articulate it and defend it. Uh, they just think like it's just got to be true, like you know it just has to be. But the lack of articulation, it leads to a theory that is so nebulous that one wonders what it could possibly be. So John Ehrman, he says, there are almost as many versions of relationalism as there are relationalists. And as far as I can tell, that's not a good thing for the relational theory of time. A theory that can be barely articulated, that's no theory at all. So that's the general idea with, uh, well, like, like for the first problem. Here's the second problem, though. So I think that a lot of approaches to the relational theory entails some kind of circularity. 
So the general idea within the relational theory of time is refusal to take time to be an entity or uh, within our ontology. So the relationalist wants to reduce time away to something more basic, some non-temporal entity that we already accept in our ontology. And how this reduction is achieved, like that's what's for, uh, that's like up for grabs. But the goal is to offer a more like ontologically parsimonious picture of the world. But I believe that the different attempts to do this, they're going to fall victim to different kinds of circularity problems. So here's an example. So it's common to say that time is merely the measure of change. That sounds fine until you ask the question, what is change? Because most philosophers define change in terms of time. So let me give you an example of this. So D.H. Meller, so Hugh Meller, he says, change here I take to be temporal variation in the properties of things. By this, I mean that changes are things having at different times incompatible properties, properties that no one thing could have at the same time. So notice the circularity here. So change is defined in terms of time, yet time was supposed to be the thing that we reduce away to change. So that's an unfortunate sort of circularity. So let's look at one more attempt to get the relational theory up and running. So this is from Robin Le Pettivin. I'm not going to try to do his accent. I can't do the posh English <laughs> accent like he does. He's, he's got such a good accent. Um, so he says relationalism. He says that time is just an ordered series of events, each individual moment identified with a collection of simultaneous events. And I want to say this isn't a good start either. So notice that the definition includes the word simultaneous, but that's a temporal notion, which was the very thing we're trying to account for. And yet the problem, I think, goes deeper when you start asking other questions like, what is an event? So Ulrich Mayer points out that the standard definitions of an event introduce time into the definition of an event, and thus we get this vicious circularity. So Mayer writes, if events are made up of times, then times cannot also be made up of events. So typically, when you look at your standard textbooks on metaphysics, they're going to say an event is a substance having a property of time. And you see this in Richard Swinburne. And then uh, Dr. Craig and J.P. Moreland, they have this nice book called Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview. And so here's the definition of an event in Philosophical Foundations. An event is the coming, continued possession or going of a property by a substance at or through a time. So again, Time has been brought into the story when it was meant to be explained by something more fundamental. And so that's one of several different kinds of circularity problems that I think the relational theory continually faces. Well, I'm not sure that there's any vicious circularity here, Ryan. Uh, it's just notoriously difficult to define time in non-temporal categories. So I think any circularity uh, here needn't be thought of as vicious. We can take certain notions to be undefinable primitives. Uh, so, for example, suppose I say that time is a relation of before and after dependent upon events. And you ask, but what is an event? And I say, an event is that which happens. Full stop. Uh, I have no further analysis to offer of what an event is. Uh, you just reach bedrock at some point, and I, I, I don't think that you need to be able to um, give uh, a, a, an explanation in deeper non-temporal terms. And I think that your own view appears to suffer from this same circularity problem, because you said initially, and I quote, the absolute theory takes time to be an eternal, uncaused substance. But the word eternal meant lasting throughout all time, so that the definition of time is circular. Hmm. Yeah, so the relational view, as I'm seeing it, is, is supposed to be saying it's not a thing in our ontology, right? And we're reducing it away to something else, some non-temporal thing. And so one of the worries I have is, well, is this, is again, when you're reducing it to an event, is saying, okay, that's a non-temporal thing. And they're like, what's an event? And then you build time back in. And I'm like, well, that now it doesn't sound like a non-temporal thing. Uh, so we've got a problem there. And then if we want to take these temporal primitive notions, it feels a bit, it feels a bit odd. Like you might be taking the primitive notion or playing the primitive card too soon is another possible worry. So I'm still not seeing how to get out of the circularity. And then I've got this other worry of, might be playing the primitive card too soon. I don't know. I don't know if I explained that very well, though. I understand what you're saying. Um, 
but I, I, it seems to me almost inevitable when it comes to time that you're going to reach notions like change, event, and so forth, which can't be defined in non-temporal terms. And I, I'm not attempting to reduce time to non-temporal features of reality. I, I think that's impossible. Mm -hmm. it, it's simply that I want to have a non-substantival view of time. And even your own view, as I say, is really non-substantival because you don't really identify God with time but with an attribute or mode of God, which is quite different. So what about my allegation that your own view suffers from the same circularity by use of the word eternal to define mm -hmm. what time is? Yeah, so I guess I wouldn't see quite the same problem. So if the relational theory is trying to say we don't have time is a fundamental feature in reality. So we've got to figure out another way to ground all of our temporal notions. This view is saying time is a fundamental feature of reality. I don't, I don't see like why I'm going to try to start explaining things in non-temporal terms. Uh, there's, a, there's a reason why the world has to be described in temporal terms and why these notions of temporality are primitive, because time is a fundamental, essential feature of reality. That's, that's the idea. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm really deeply committed to that notion that time is a fundamental feature of, uh, of reality. Uh, I think you're right that probably some relationalists do pursue a sort of reductionist program, but I have no interest in, in some kind of reductionism. Uh, and, and, and therefore, I do think probably you will be confronted with a sort of non-vicious circularity ultimately, and I'm not sure any of us can avoid that, but you and I are on the same page in not wanting to reduce time to, what did you say, a non-fundamental reality or something? There are non-temporal, uh, no, like fundamental features that are non-temporal. No, we don't, neither of us wants to do that. Okay, well, I think we got some clarity on each of our, or each of your guys' understandings of time. So, Again, yes. we've been talking about time so far, and I think now is the time uh, to yeah. do a terrible pun. <laughs> uh, now is the time to bridge into philosophy of religion and connect these ideas with like God, creation, and, and things like that. So both of you affirm that um, God is temporal, at least with creation, but you disagree about God's state causally prior to creation. So um, let's start by devi defining divine timelessness and divine temporality. So um, Dr. Craig, can you take us through divine timelessness and divine temporality? Like, what do these mean? Sure. To say that God is temporal is to say that God has both temporal location and temporal duration. And to say that he's timeless is to say that he is not temporal. So these are contradictories. Um, being temporal involves having a temporal location and a temporal duration, and being timeless is to be non-temporal. Yeah, Brian, if you want to add anything. Yeah, just, just to make clear to the audience, so when you're looking historically at philosophy East and West, everyone agrees that if God exists, God is eternal, meaning God exists without beginning and without end. Um, but there's different ways to interpret what else you want to add on to that. And so the timelessness claim is going to be adding on these statements about no succession, no temporal location, no duration, uh, whereas temporality is going to go, yeah, God exists without beginning, without end. No one thinks God begins to exist. Well, there's a few crazy people here or there who say that sort of stuff, but but Bill and I are not doing that. We're not doing that. Uh, we're going to say God does not begin to exist because God necessarily exists. But at some point in the life of God, um, God's going to have temporal location. He's going to undergo succession. He's going to endure. Uh, these are the kind of claims from temporality. Yeah. So to, as I like to think about it, I like to like visualize it in terms of succession, right? So under divine mm -hmm. temporality, like God's going to undergo succession in some manner, like he might think one thing and then another, or he might know that it's 12 p.m. and then it's 12.01. Uh, whereas under divine timelessness, there's no succession in God's life. So anything that God experiences, anything in God's life is just kind of had in this one timeless moment. It's just all there and there's no succession. There's no one thing after another. It's just, yeah, it's just all there. Yeah. Kind of, as I think of almost a frozen life. But anyway, um, okay. Uh, well, another piece of the puzzle here. Yeah. If I might interject something here, Joe, I think you are right. But in talking about temporal succession, that is presupposing the truth of a tense theory of time, which in my view is the real watershed issue. On a tenseless 
theory of time, there really is no succession of moments one after another. They're all equally real and existent, just like the intervals on a spatial line. The first inch of a yardstick is not uh, any earlier than the, the second inch, and the second inch is not a successor of the first. Uh, and so in talking about temporal succession, I think we're presupposing a tense view of time, which I think is correct, but it's good to be self-conscious that, that that is what we're doing. That's good. That's a great clarification. Actually, yeah. I, want, I want to reject that because oh. so Natalia Ding, who is a contemporary proponent of the B theory of time, the tenseless theory of time, one of the points she hammers over and over is that there is an actual account of succession. There's no account of temporal becoming, but she thinks temporal becoming and succession come apart. So the ordering of the moments on the B theory is successive. It is earlier and later than relations. And then she says, those are successive ordering relations. And you see this in a lot of other B theorists as well. So you see this in Ted Sider and whatnot. Now, what Bill can, you, what you can say is you can go, I see they want to make that claim. It's just not coherent yeah. and reject it. Um, but I want to say at least I, they really are going to the mat and saying like, no, 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 we, we've got all the succession you'd ever want. Yeah, I think both of those are good clarifications. So we've got divine timelessness and divine temporality down, and now we can go on to um, the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. So Ryan, how do you understand this doctrine? Eventually, we're getting to we're getting to the juicy stuff, audience. So, but we yeah. have to lay the foundations yeah. first. So yeah, Ryan. Right. So typically, people say that the doctrine means that God did not create the universe out of any pre-existent material, and that's fine. But that's not the full story when you look at like you know, Western history. So what I'm doing is I'm following a very standard uh, set of medieval definitions that, that actually you can trace back to some kind of earlier uh, pre-Christian era. So there's this really ancient debate that carried on into the Middle Ages between what's called a doctrine of eternal creation and a doctrine of creation out of nothing. So, to, so according to Samuel Liebens, he says, creation ex nihilo can be understood as the affirmation, and this is a quote from, from Sam, the universe was created by God at some point in time, perhaps the first moment in time, before which there was nothing except God. And so Sam says this, this doctrine is going to be distinct from eternal creation, which is the universe has always existed with no beginning. It is nevertheless God's creation. He is eternally creating it, giving it being. And so I want to elaborate on, on a particular point because sometimes people accuse me of making stuff up and sometimes people make this sort of accusation against, against uh, Craig's view as well. There's this point that I think has been lost in a lot of contemporary philosophical theology, and it's this idea of God existing all alone. So in the ancient and medieval world, it's assumed that if something begins to exist, it is preceded by non-existence. You see this take a huge role in a lot of Christian and a lot of Islamic debates about the temporality or the timelessness of God. And so here's what it means for the doctrine of creation out of nothing. So the doctrine of creation ex nihilo says that the universe began to exist, so it cannot be co-eternal with a God who lacks a beginning. And this in turn entails that there's some sort of state of affairs where God exists all alone without creation. And you see this explicitly affirmed by Christians, Jews, and Muslims. So let me just give you three quick examples. So Boethius. Boethius says, now this our religion, which is called Christian and Catholic, is founded chiefly on the following assertions. From all eternity, that is, before the world was established, and so before all that is meant by time began, there has existed one divine substance of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say, we affirm one God, not three gods. Um, but then he goes on to say that he did not produce it from his own substance, uh, that he determined to form the world and brought it into being when it was absolutely not. So you see that idea of something begins to exist when it's preceded by non-existence. Let me give you a Jewish example. So I just give you a Christian example. Let me give you a Jewish example. So Moses Maimonides, he says, in the beginning, God alone existed and nothing else. So you've got God alone, God and no cosmic stuff. Now let me give you an Islamic thinker, Al-Ghazali. He says, God brought the universe into being after its non-existence and made it something after it had been nothing, since from eternity he alone was existent and there was nothing along with him. I could belabor the point with lots of other historical sources, but here's the big idea. Creation out of nothing, it does involve the claim that God exists all alone. And that's what reinforces the claim that God's not making the universe out of any pre-existent material. There really is God all alone, and he's free to create or not create. And I want to say this is important because, again, some of the arguments I've run, some of the arguments that Craig has run against timelessness, people just ignore this entirely and say, oh, God and the universe are always co-eternal. God never exists without the universe. And I'm going to go, I'm sorry, 
that's not basic yeah. church history. Like we have to be, like, even if you're saying you're going to affirm certain Christian doctrines, you have to affirm the actual Christian doctrine. That's, that's the idea. Yes, I love it that Ryan has emphasized the inherently temporal nature of creatio ex nihilo. And this understanding of the doctrine is in sharp contrast with Thomas Aquinas' view, according to which creation does not imply a temporal beginning of existence. Rather, for Aquinas, it simply means that God is the sole source of being of created things. He didn't create them out of anything. He is their sole ground of being, and that's consistent with eternal creation. But biblically speaking, the idea of creation is inherently bound up with a temporal beginning of the world, and hence a state of affairs in which God alone exists without uh, the world, without creation. And so I think that the, uh, the, the view that Ryan is expressing is the more um, faithful biblical concept of creation. I would only want to qualify Ryan's statement, uh, quote, if something begins to exist, it is preceded by a state of non-existence. Um, that's not, in fact, what Samuel Labans uh, said. What Laban said was, the universe was created by God at some point in time before which there was nothing. And so Laban's view doesn't imply that if time began to exist, or, or if the universe began to exist, there was a time uh, prior to the beginning of the universe, a time of non-existence. What he says is that it means there is a point in time before which nothing existed. Yeah, so this is not Sam's view about what the definition of what it means to begin to exist. It's the historical Western view of what it means to begin to exist. So you can see this trace back to uh, debates over how to interpret Plato that influence a lot of Jewish, Christian, and Islamic debates over sh should we say that God creates uh, out of nothing or should we say that, um, that the universe is, is co-eternal with God? Uh, and so, and you see that really explicitly in the Al Ghazali quote that I have, um, where he says, God brought it, the universe, into being after its non existence. And then you see this also in Ibn Taymiyyah, who wants to reject creation out of nothing. He thinks it's awful. It's, like it's the worst doctrine ever. I want to have a, a doctrine of eternal creation. But he still affirms that anything that God does create, it begins to exist. Any given item that God creates, it begins to exist after a state of non existence. So, this is like a deep, deep uh, understanding of how. Uh, or the definition of what it means to begin to exist that you see throughout the Western uh, debates over these sort of things. That's, that's the claim I'm making. I think that's just a façon de parler, mm. Ryan, when they say the world began to, to exist after uh, something like that, because people like Ghazali and Boethius conceive of God as timeless uh, in its being, in his being, uh, and, and therefore, it's just an almost inevitable façon de parler to say that uh, if the universe began to exist, then uh, it came into being after God had existed alone. But I, I don't think that that should be pressed for technical precision. Oh, oh, yeah, I want to press it all day long because I can't understand... Mm -hmm. <laughs> the problems that they are facing without that. So when I look at Augustine and then all sorts of debates that follow from there, like the worries he has are about this exact claim that if you Christians, you silly Christians, you're, you know, you're denying the science of the day that says the universe is eternal. If you're going to say the universe began, you have this problem of God alone, then God with cosmic stuff. So that's one of like the main arguments against like, uh, like the doctrine of creation out of nothing you see historically. Oh, but, but Augustine is the sort of prime candidate for the person who says that it's foolish to ask what God was doing prior to uh, creation, because time comes into being with creation. He says God created the universe with time, not in time. So I think you can find this other current of thought that I'm describing as well, and that Laban's correctly characterized rather than pressing 
this façon de parler to, for philosophical precision. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well, well I, I, yeah. we should, for the sake of time, we should just agree say, to disagree. Yeah, I was about to say, um, we do want to get to like the main meat of the disagreement, which is the view yeah. of timeless sans creation. Um, so that's really what we're coming up to. And we've got a good 20 minutes or something like that mm -hmm. to talk about yeah. that. Um, so uh, Dr. Craig, yeah, you defend the view that um, God is timeless sans creation and temporal with creation. So can you explain a bit to the audience, firstly, what that means? And then secondly, maybe sketch a little bit about why you think that's true. Okay, well, as strange as this view sounds, uh, it does seem to me to be the best view of God and time and is entirely plausible. Um, suppose you adopt a relational view of time. Well, in that case, um, with the beginning of the past series of temporal events, there were no events going on prior to creation. Creation was the first event. Uh, we don't want to say, I think, that God has lived through an infinite regress of events, because this would just cause all sorts of uh, problems. So on a relational view, there just wouldn't be any time prior to creation. Time begins with the occurrence of the first event at uh, when God creates the world. On the other hand, if we adopt a substantival view of time, then God is the creator of all things must be the creator of time itself, and therefore uh, God must be timeless without creation since he creates time. So on either a relational view or sub substantival view, it seems to me that God must be timeless sans creation. But once time begins, can God be timeless. Well, here I think it's very difficult to see how God can be timeless if he coexists with the temporal world. In view of his real causal relationship to temporal things and his knowledge of tense facts, which would be constantly changing. So it seems to me that God must be in time since the moment of creation. All right. Um, and Ryan, of course, you're not the biggest fan of the view that God is timeless sans creation. Um, so why is that? Well, so I should say I used to be, because when I was 19 years old, I bought two books to try to understand God and time better. One was Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. That didn't help me out at all. Um, and then the other one was was Craig's uh, Time and Eternity. And so I was like, oh, Oh, this is this is amazing. This is the best stuff ever. So for the long for the longest time, I was like, Bill, whatever you're saying, it's got to be gospel truth. Um, but now now I want to push back. So um, so yeah. So here, here's here's the idea. So I, here's a question I get a lot uh, from a lot of different philosophers. Some who are really sympathetic to divine temporality, others who want to reject it. They'll go, What exactly does it mean to say that God is timeless without creation and temporal with creation? What's the relationship between those two different phases of God's life? And so this is where you could run different kinds of objections. So you can't say that this timeless phase is temporal, temporally before. And like Bill, like you don't, I know we know, we all know you don't want to do that uh, because then you'd be saying God's temporal before he's temporal. That's crazy. And that's why you want to say he's timeless sans without, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't think you can say that the timeless phase is causally prior to the temporal phase either. And this is for two reasons. So first, I take it to be a basic causal principle that efficient causes are temporally prior to their effects, in which case the timeless phase would be temporally prior to the temporal phase, and that's going to be incoherent. Uh, and then second, it, um, so Bill, correct me if I'm wrong here, but if I understand the view correctly, the timeless phase is not causing anything. The temporal phase is simultaneously causing the universe at the first moment of, of time. Uh, so God is the temporal phase of God is simultaneously causing the universe to exist at the first moment of time. And if that's the case, then there's no causal priority before the timeless phase and the temporal phase, because the timeless phase isn't causing anything. He's eternally willing or desiring that a universe exists, but the temporal phase is the thing doing all the, the causal work. And then I don't think mere logical priority can capture the relationship between a timeless and a temporal phase either. This is because relations of logical priority, they can only obtain between things that are mutually compatible, like the premises and conclusion of a valid argument. So relations of logical priority, they cannot obtain between incompatible states of affairs. 
So for example, uh, consider the classical theistic claim that from all eternity, the father timelessly causes the son to, temp to timelessly exist. So you've got a timeless cause with a timeless effect, and so they're always there together. And you could talk about logical priority in this case. The father's logically prior to the son, but there's no state of affairs with the father existing without the son. They're, 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 they're co-instantiated. They're mutually consistent. Now consider a panentheist. So the panentheistic claim is that God and creation are co-eternal. God's logically prior to creation, but both are going to be co-eternal. And so as Alan Rhoda points out, logical priority cannot be captured by incompatible states of affairs, such as God is undecided as to whether or not he'll create and God is creating the universe. Those are incompatible states of affairs. So God's logical priority is consistent with the doctrine of eternal creation, but I don't see how it's going to be consistent with creation ex nihilo. And this is because creation ex nihilo involves incompatible states of affairs, God existing alone without a universe and God existing with a universe. So I don't think logical priority is going to capture what's going on because otherwise the panentheists like Benedict Gurka and, and Tom Ward are going to say, well, that's what I affirm. That's, that's, that's the doctrine of eternal creation. Uh, so, so the main reason I want to reject uh, Craig's view now is because I just don't really understand exactly what's going on between the timeless phase and the temporal phase. Yeah, you guys can go back and forth on this freely. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've already suggested reasons why we should think that God does not endure through an infinite regress of temporal events. Um, and I think that we can con affirm God's causal priority to the universe if we think of a cause as the causal agent who at the first moment of creation acted to bring the universe into being. Clearly, that agent did not come into being at the first moment of creation. So the uh, agent cause of the origin of the universe uh, does exist, I think, causally prior to the existence of time in the universe. But I also think that we could construe God as being logically prior to creation. Um, I disagree that logically incompatible states of affairs cannot stand in relations of logical priority. Take Alan Rhoda's example of uh, the state of affairs. God is undecided as to whether or not he will create, and the state of affairs, God is creating a universe. Well, that just is the classic Christian doctrine concerning God's freedom to create or to refrain from creation. Logically, prior to God's decree to create a world, God is undecided as to whether or not he will create. So it seems to me quite wrong to say that logically incompatible states of affairs can't stand in relations of logical priority. Uh, finally, I think we could say that God is ontologically prior to creation in the simple sense that he does not come into being at the moment of creation. Rather, as Ryan insists, God exists alone without creation, and in that sense he's ontologically prior to creation. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I want to make sure I get this. So there's three reasons uh, you mentioned. So infinite regress sort of reasons. Um, mm -hmm. And then you want to say, Rhoda, uh, I love you, but you're just wrong. Uh, you can have these inconsistent uh, or incompatible states of affairs. And I also redefended causal priority if we right. think of it in not as event causation, but in terms of agent causation. Mm -hmm. And then, so that's the ontological priority here we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So... Um, the infinite regress, that's, that's fine, I because I want to avoid an infinite regress. I don't want to have um, an infinite past at all. Uh, and there's, so Swinburne has changed his views on this over the years. Uh, and so Swinburne and Dean Zimmerman, they're going to say, yeah, so when God exists all alone, when this pre-creation moment, it's a moment that doesn't begin to exist, but it's a single moment uh -huh. uh, because it's not preceded by non-existence. And I know, and I now understand where you're going to be like, oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. Um, but that's that's one of the moves they're going to make and say, like, I can agree with you. Yeah, we don't have an infinite regress. Uh, and there's some different Islamic thinkers too who, who do this uh, historically. Uh, they're the minority view, but there's a few of them who have this view that looks remarkably like Swinburne's, where you've got God all alone, and they say, yeah, there's no, is not preceded by non-existence, so that's fine. Um, 
and for all the Kalam kind of reasons. And then they go, and for math, once God creates, though, then you get the succession of all these, these moments from there. Um, so the first moment, in a sense, is this, this pre-creation state of affairs. Could I interrupt? So you avoid the infinite regress. At mm -hmm. this, could I interrupt, please? Yeah, 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 go for it. Uh, oh, oh, that view is perfectly acceptable to me. Um, that is a view that I characterize as the Oxford School uh, mm -hmm. of thinking about divine eternity, which characterized Richard Swinburne, um, Alan Paget, and John Lucas. And I'm I'm happy with that view, uh, and I think it's an alternative to my view. So if that's your view, um, great, go for it. I, I I don't have an object. Well, I do have objections to it. I there you go. I, I think. As I've explained in the book, God, Time, and Eternity, I, I think that my view is more plausible than yours, than that view, the Oxford School view. But it is an acceptable um, view uh, philosophically and theologically. So uh, that, that I think that that really, really narrows any disagreement between us. Mm -hmm. So then let's look at the two others. Um, let's look at the... So you wanted to push back on Alan Rhoda's claim. Uh, so when Alan Rhoda is looking at this, he's having a debate with Catherine Rogers. And so, so Kate, she's wanting to defend the claim that God is timeless. Uh, and she's trying to defend God's timeless foreknowledge being consistent with, um, human freedom. And, and Alan goes, no, because logical priority, uh, is, is the move that Kate tries to make saying God's logically prior to the universe, his decision to create or not creates logically prior and and he's and Alan Rhoda goes no that makes no sense um, you can't have mere logical priority here because you've got incompatible states of affairs uh, so God deciding whether or not to create he's undecided that should be have an open future is is the that's the move he wants to make yeah can I interrupt again at this point yeah uh, that just seems to me quite wrong and that I mean mm -hmm. I'm not sympathetic with Roger's view of God and time but she's She's right. This is this is classic Christian doctrine, uh, and it, it comes out not only in the decrees of God that I mentioned, but in Molinism. Now, I don't know how you feel about Molinism, but logically prior to God's foreknowledge of the future would be God's natural knowledge and his middle knowledge, and in that state of affairs, God does not know what will happen because he hasn't yet decreed which of the feasible worlds shall be actual. Um, so you've got a relationship there of logical priority where the states are incompatible with each other in terms of in the state of free knowledge, God does have foreknowledge of the future, whereas in the state of middle knowledge or natural knowledge, he does not. But the one is logically prior to the other, and the free knowledge is explained in terms of God's middle knowledge and his divine decree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Alan doesn't like, you know, Alan's an open theist, so he wants to reject all of that. Oh, Whereas okay. I like my Molinism. I like my Molinism. <laughs> I but, didn't know that. Yeah. But I want to make those, those, those logical moments, I want to make them temporal moments because I want to oh. say, John Dunn Scotus, I love that you gave us these logical moments. They're fun. They're a lot of fun and thought experiments. But it's just not really plausible because what I have is in a single timeless moment, I've got God not knowing the future and knowing the future. And you can go, well, yeah, at the logical moment. Um, and so I'm like, what's, 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 what is, how, how is it from all eternity God's ignorant of the future and, he's, and, he, and he knows the future? That, that doesn't sound right to me. Um, and you can say it's in terms of logical moments. I've got the worry right. about uh, intrinsic, um, uh, like, problem of temporary intrinsics, except you'd have to call it the problem of logical intrinsics. So the same kind of problems you have with um, trying to combine uh, a B theory or an eternalist ontology of time with an endurantist account of, of uh, persistence. If you say an object exists as a whole all at once, but it exists at multiple moments, it gets contradictory properties. So what you do to remove that is you introduce temporal parts. I don't like temporal parts. I hate that. That's why I want to be like, let's be a presentist, get rid of it. But it seems like you're going to have to do the same kind of thing if you're going, well, in a single timeless moment, I've got God existing as a whole all at once. You know, Because um, Anselm teaches us that's the uh, perfection that God must have. But now God's not knowing stuff at 
the logical moment of natural knowledge and knowing stuff at the logical moment of free knowledge, those are incompatible properties that he has all at once as a whole. So I've got something like the analogous to the problem of temporary intrinsics. And I know that we only have five minutes left, so that's a lot to try to Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll turn over to Dr. Craig. Okay, I'll just ask a clarification question. On your view, I hope that you affirm that God has from eternity past complete foreknowledge of future contingents and of the future. But wouldn't you say that God is nonetheless free not to create so that his foreknowledge could have been different? Uh, that I wouldn't want to put it quite in those terms because it sounds like I'm positing some sort of counterfactual uh, power over the past, uh, or at least over the logical past, something like that. Yeah. Do, do, I don't know. Do you, uh, do you understand the worry that I have? Yes. But I think having the distinction of logical moments escapes that problem of construing these moments as temporal. But in any case, this is extremely interesting, Ryan. I'm, I'm glad yeah. we had this conversation. Yeah, and I, yeah. I guess I have one question before we uh, close this out, and it's for Dr. Craig. So when, and it's about your view on sort of timelessness sans creation. Um, when we're looking at our ontological inventory, that is our list of what there is, um, and I guess we could talk about our current ontological inventory and what there is presently or something like that. Uh, I don't think we're going to want to include on that list God's timeless phase wherein he exists without creation. So it seems like in some sense it has passed away, like it no longer exists. But if that's the case, then it seems as though one might think that it sort of stands in a temporal relation, like it no longer exists. It was the case, but no longer exists. And you might think that timeless things can't stand in temporal relations like that. So um, the, I'll, we'll just, I'll close it out with you, just giving an answer to that question, and then we'll just offer some final thoughts. I, I fully understand that intuition. Um, and I simply want to say that it's it's purely a figment of the imagination to think of God existing literally temporally prior to the moment of creation. Uh, you can think of God as logically prior, ontologically prior, I think even causally prior, but not chronologically prior uh, to creation. And therefore, you just have to resist that intuition that this state of affairs uh, is something that is in the past and has passed away. All right. Sounds great. Well, thank you guys both for this conversation. I hope it was very edifying for the audience. I certainly enjoyed it, and uh, I hope both you guys enjoyed it. So, um, yeah, thank you guys both for coming on. I certainly enjoyed yeah, thank it. You. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.